Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Om Namo Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 3, Text 24. Tata Kalo Sampravrite Sammo Haya Suradivisham Buddho Nam Nanjana Sutta Kika Teshu Bhavishyati. Translation Then in the beginning of Kali Yuga, the Lord will appear as Lord Buddha, the son of Anjana in the province of Gaya just for the purpose of deluding those who are envious of the faithful theist. Purport, Lord Buddha, a powerful incarnation of the personality of Godhead appeared in the province of Gaya, Bihar, Biha, as the son of Anjana and he preached his own conception of non-violence and deprecated even the animal sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas. At the time when Lord Buddha appeared, the people in general were atheistic and preferred animal flesh to anything else. On the plea of Vedic sacrifice, every place was practically turned into a slaughterhouse and animal killing was indulged in unrestrictedly. Lord Buddha preached non-violence, taking pity on the poor animals. He preached that he did not believe in the tenets of the Vedas and stressed the adverse psychological effect incurred by animal killing. Less intelligent men of the age of Kali who had no faith in God followed his principle and for the time being they were trained in moral discipline and non-violence, the preliminary steps for proceeding further on the path of God-realization. He deluded the atheists because such atheists who followed his principles did not believe in God, but they kept their absolute faith in Lord Buddha, who himself was the incarnation of God. Thus the faithless people were made to believe in God in the form of Lord Buddha. That was the mercy of Lord Buddha. He made the faithless faithful to him. Killing of animals before the advent of Lord Buddha was the most prominent feature of this society. People claim that these were Vedic sacrifices. When the Vedas are not accepted through the authoritative disciplic succession, the casual readers of the Vedas are misled by the flowery language of that system of knowledge. In the Bhagavad Gita, a comment has been made on such foolish scholars. Avi, mm, avipaschitaha. Avipaschitaha. The foolish scholars of Vedic literature who do not care to receive the transcendental message through the transcendental realized sources of disciplic succession are sure to be bewildered. To them, the ritualistic ceremonies are considered to be all in all. They have no depth of knowledge. According to the Bhagavad Gita, Vedaishya Savayaraha Meva Vedyaha. The whole system of the Vedas is to lead one gradually to the path of the Supreme Lord. The whole theme of Vedic literature is to know the Supreme Lord, the individual soul, the cosmic situation, and the relation between all these items. When the relation is known, the relative function begins, and as a result of such a function, the ultimate goal of life, or going back to Godhead, takes place in the easiest manner. Unfortunately, unauthorized scholars of the Vedas become captivated by the purificatory ceremonies only and natural progress is thereby checked. To such bewildered persons of atheistic propensity, Lord Buddha is the emblem of theism. He therefore first of all wanted to check the habit of animal killing. The animal killers are dangerous elements on the path going back to Godhead. There are two types of animal killers. The soul is also sometimes called the animal or the living being. Therefore, both the slaughterers of animals and those who have lost their identity of soul are animal killers. 
Maharaj Parikshit said that only the animal killer cannot relish the transcendental message of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, if people are to be educated to the path of Godhead, they must be taught first and foremost to uh, stop the process of animal killing, as above mentioned. It is understood to say that animal it is sorry, it is nonsensical to say that animal killing has nothing to do with spiritual realization. By this dangerous theory, many so called sannyasis have sprung up by the grace of Kali Yuga who preach animal killing under the garb of the Vedas. The subject matter has already been discussed in the conversation between Lord Chaitanya and Maulana Chandkazi. Shaheb. The animal sacrifice, as stated in the Vedas, is different from the unrestricted animal killing in the slaughterhouse, because the asuras, or the so-called scholars of Vedic literatures, put forward the evidence of animal killing in the Vedas, Lord Buddha superficially denied the authority of the Vedas. This rejection of the Vedas by Lord Buddha was adopted in order to save people from the vice of animal killing as well as to save the poor animals from the slaughtering process of their big brothers who clamor for universal brotherhood, peace, justice and equity. There is no justice when there is animal killing. Lord Buddha wanted to stop it completely and therefore his cult of Ahimsa was propagated not only in India but also outside the country. Technically, Lord Buddha's philosophy is called atheistic because there is no acceptance of the Supreme Lord and because that system of philosophy denied the authority of the Vedas, but that is an act of camouflage by the Lord. Lord Buddha is the incarnation of Godhead. As such, he is the original propounder of Vedic knowledge. He therefore cannot reject Vedic philosophy, but he rejected it outwardly because the Suradvisha, or the demons who are always envious of the devotees of Godhead try to support cow killing or animal killing from the pages of the Vedas. And this is now being done by the modernized sannyasis. Lord Buddha had to reject the authority of the Vedas altogether. This is simply technical and had it not been so, he would not have been so accepted as the incarnation of Godhead nor would he have been worshipped in the transcendental songs of the poet Jayadev, who is a Vaishnav Acharya. Lord Buddha preached the preliminary principles of the Vedas in a manner suitable for the time being, and so also did Shankaracharya, to establish the authority of the Vedas. Therefore, both Lord Buddha and Acharya Shankara paved the path of theism, and Vaishnava Acharya, specifically Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, led the people on the path towards a realization of going back to Godhead. We are glad that people are taking interest in the non violent movement of Lord Buddha, but will they take the matter very seriously and close the animal slaughterhouses altogether? If not, there is no meaning to the Ahimsa cult. Srimad Bhagavatam was composed just prior to the beginning of the age of Kali about 5,000 years ago, and Lord Buddha appeared about 2,600 years ago. Therefore, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Buddha is foretold. Such is the authority of this clear scripture. There are many such prophecies, and they are being fulfilled one after another. They will indicate the positive standing of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is without trace of mistake, illusion, cheating, and imperfection which are the four flaws of all conditioned souls. The liberated souls are above these flaws, therefore they can see and foretell things which are to take place on distant. Uh, as I'm in Sri Lanka, which I'm not usually, <laughs> I thought to speak following uh, Srila Prabhupada's purport on Lord Buddha, as Sri Lanka is one of the uh, few places in the world which is dominated by Buddhists and the majority population is Buddhist. Uh, only Thailand is probably... Uh, there are other countries also, but it's, 
They're changing now the culture. They're Laos, Cambodia. Changing means Christianity, communism, all this kind of thing have having their effect. Anyway, uh, Lord Buddha, from the perspective of Srimad Bhagavatam, is mentioned here as a prophecy, Bhavishyati, means will be, because Srimad Bhagavatam was uh, compiled in its present form 5,000 years ago, whereas Lord Buddha appeared uh, according to Vedic chronology about 3,000 years ago. Um, now the main point that uh, Srila Prabhupada makes here about Lord Buddha is the message of non-violence and uh, the Vaishnava Acharyas um, they understand that Lord Buddha appeared uh, surprisingly not exactly the main reason not exactly the main reason to preach Buddhism but to stop an animal killing or at least to stop wanton animal killing animal killing is always there in human society mostly throughout the history of the world as Srila Prabhupada mentions even in uh, the time when Vedic culture dominated the world uh, animal killing was there uh, but with a different purpose it wasn't exactly killing in the sense that the animal was killed in sacrifice and then uh, revived to a better status of life um, Jaidev Jaidev Goswami who uh, we could say is um, the inspiration for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, inner ecstasy of uh, he at the opening of his Gita Govinda which is not only a Gauriya text it was there was no Gauriya Sampradaya at the time of Jaidev Goswami um, but he he uh, glorifies Keshava Krishna who has taken the form of Buddha by saying Nindasi Yagya Vidhe Ahaha Shruti Jatam Sadaya Hridaya Darshita Pashukhatam Keshava Dhritta Buddha Sharira Jaya Jagadisha Hare so uh, this uh, one verse, ten, ten verses, Jayadev Goswami, uh, in his Dashavata Stotram, uh, he brings out the main point in just two lines of each of these ten uh, avatars. And for Lord Buddha, he brings out the point that uh, Lord Buddha criticized the process of animal sacrifice nindasi yagya vidhe that is stated or is established in the Vedas and out of the compassion of his heart uh, he wanted to stop the killing of animals Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his uh, Discussion. He doesn't speak. We don't find in Chaitanya Charitamrita much about Buddhists or Buddhism. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu discussing Mayavadis uh, with Mayavadis uh, with Savabom. There was a big Mayavadi that Vedna uh, Mani Abod. Because the Buddhists do not accept the Vedas, therefore they are considered. Uh, therefore they are considered atheists, and actually they are na astika. It it no, it is not the, the Buddha yeah, or Buddhist philosophy upholds the principle of uh, anatta which is Pali for Anatma. There is no self, either individual or 
in the Mayavadi's conception of a universal self, there is no such thing. It's just a big imagination according to Buddhists. But they are, according to Lord Chaitanya, they're considered atheists because um, they don't recognize the Vedas. <clears throat> but as Srila Prabhupada points out in this purport, um, although they don't recognize any god, they're atheists, they worship non-Buddha. As the other day in Kandy, we visited the temple of Buddha's tooth, which is the main Buddhist holy place in all of Sri Lanka, which is quite ironic because uh, Lord Buddha, his teachings, if, if we were to take them at face value, he is not to be worshipped. No one is to be worshipped. But they worship his tooth. So the, as Srila Prabhupada points out in this purport, um, Lord Buddha tricked the atheists into worshipping him. And he also established the cult of Ahimsa. This word is Ahimsa is known even in the English-speaking world among trendy people who think they're spiritual. Uh, people are influenced by Buddhism. Uh, it's one of those words which has gone from Sanskrit into English, along with many others like karma, yoga, guru, pandit, often in a misunderstood form. Of course, they're often misunderstood even in India itself. Uh, Ahimsa, yeah. Originally Sanskrit, the Buddhist cult was originally, it seems, um, preached and recorded in Pali and other Prakrita languages. And later, it was uh, Buddhist texts were composed in Sanskrit also. Uh, another mention of Lord Buddha in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Buddha Avatar. This we just read from Canto, uh, Canto One, Chapter Three, where there is a list of, incarn of incarnations or avatars, and also there's a, uh, a list in Canto Two, Chapter Seven, uh, in which sorry, uh, yeah, text thirty-seven describes uh, another. Avatar of Lord Buddha, David Visham Nigama Vartmani Nishtana Nam Pur Bhir Mayena Vihita Bhir Adrisha Tar Bhihi Tur Bhihi Lo Kangna Tang Lo Kangna Tang Man Vimoham Mati Pralobham Vesham Vidhaya Bahubhashata O Padharmyam. So, translation. When the atheists, after being well versed in the Vedic scientific knowledge, annihilate inhabitants of different planets, flying unseen in the sky on well built rockets prepared by the great scientist Maya, the Lord will bewilder their minds by dressing himself attractively as Buddha and will preach on sub-religious principles. So uh, it, it seems that Lord Buddha, uh, various forms of Buddha appeared in various ages and speak on various sub-religious principles, upadharma, that's mentioned in this verse here, upadharmyam, uh, to uh, bring people from the path of absolute adharma, at least to the path of upadharma, which means it's not really dharma, but it's somewhat. It's not absolute adharma. It's like ahimsa. It's not, ahimsa does not in and of itself uh, constitute dharma, but it is a principle of dharma. It's part of dharma. So, Srila Prabhupada's purport to this verse, the incarnation of Lord Buddha is not the same Buddha incarnation we have in the present history of mankind. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, the Buddha incarnation mentioned in this verse appeared in a different Kali age. 
In the duration of one life of Manu, there are more than 72 Kali Yugas. And in one of them, the particular type of Buddha mentioned here would appear. Lord Buddha incarnates at a time when people are most materialistic and preaches common sense religious principles. Such a hingsa is not a religious principle in itself, but it is an important quality for persons who are actually religious. It is a common sense religion because one is advised to do no harm to any other animal or living being because such harmful actions are equally harmful to he who does the harm. But before learning these principles of non-violence, one has to learn two other principles, namely to be humble and to be prideless. Uh, so this is uh, paraphrasing the in Bhagavad Gita, Amanitva, Madhambitva, Hingsa, Kshantir, Arjava. So before Hingsa comes, Amanitva, uh, Madhambitva, uh, humble and prideless, which are almost synonymous. Unless one is humble and prideless, one cannot be harmless and non-violent. And after being non-violent, one has to learn tolerance and simplicity of living. One must offer respects to the great religious prince, preachers and spiritual leaders and also train the senses for controlled action, learning to be unattached to family and home. So this whole section is a paraphrase of that section. Uh, Asakta Anabhishvanga Putra Dara Grihadishu. This is what we're just reading here. And enacting devotional service to the Lord, etc. At the ultimate stage, one has to accept the Lord and become his devotee. Otherwise, there is no religion. In religious principles, there must be God in the center. Otherwise, simple moral instructions are merely sub religious principles, generally known as. Upadharma or nearness to religious principles. Uh, I'll just read a little more from what uh, Srila Prabhupada has written in another purport uh, to uh, Canto 6, Chapter 10, Text 9. Uh, Everyone should be unhappy to see others in distress and happy to see others happy. Atmavat Saravabhuteshu. One should feel the happiness and distress of others as his own. It is on this basis that the Buddhist religious principle of non-violence, ahimsa parama dharma, is established. We feel pain when someone disturbs us, and therefore we should not inflict pain upon other living beings. Lord Buddha's mission was to stop unnecessary animal killing, and therefore he preached that the Greatest religious principle is non-violence. One cannot continue killing animals and, and at the same time be a religious man. This is the greatest hypocrisy. Mm. So, there's non-violence. Ahimsa parama dharma. This is uh, said to be the highest Dharma, the highest religious principle, non-violence. This is comes in, in Buddhist teachings. Although um, most Buddhists, or uh, people who presume themselves, who identify themselves to be followers of Buddha, Buddha, most of them are also meat eaters. Uh, even the monks. Uh, as I heard when I was living in Thailand, attempting to do some preaching there in the 1980s, uh, um, when I asked, well, how can you eat meat? Well, they won't kill, the Buddhists will never kill, but they have someone else do the killing for them. So the, the uh, Muslim, the very small Muslim population in Thailand, except in the south of Thailand, there's a large Muslim population, but the vast majority of the country, the, the Muslim population, they kill animals. And fish, well, you pull them out of the river or the sea and they just die. You don't kill them, so to speak. Although, 
on the streets of Bangkok, it was a common sight and very more noticeable by the very strong smell of having a karai of hot oil on the on the uh, trolley. What do you call it? hot lorry? What do you call that portable trolley for selling food? I'm trying to use some words that that uh, non-Indians will understand. Hot lorry is Gujarati. Um, anyway, they have the hot oil and then a, a, a container full of live grasshoppers and empty it out into the hot oil. So people didn't sign to mind. And, and then they would sell it for people to eat. A very strong, horrible smell. So um, people have a way of changing the instructions. Even though Lord Buddha preached non-violence, it's said that the last food he ate was uh, truffles, which means, what is that, pig's brains or something? I can't remember exactly. Although some people say it's a kind of mushroom. So they say, well, he also ate it. And uh, it's also said that the Buddhist monks, when they're out, collecting, they should be detached. They go begging. The Buddhist monk, they're called bhikkhu, which is the same as Bengali for bhikshu, which is Sanskrit for, literally means, well, there's no real literal word for bhiksha. Bhiksha means begging, but religious begging of monks. So they have their bowl, and when people put meat in, they can, they should be detached. They can't say, no, no, I want this. I do. You just take whatever people give you. So if they give you meat and fish, then you should take it. I wonder if they would eat if you put stool in there. But no one does that. I mean, we never heard of such a thing. If they were tantrics, they might, or this, uh, or they're called aghori, one kind of sadhu in India. There are not many of them, but they used to do things like that, eating stool and so on, just to become detached. Anyway, um, Meat eating is is actually allowed in the Vedas, although it's not encouraged under certain circumstances. In certain, um, but generally, for a pure Vaishnava, the general standard is patram pushpam palam tauryam yome bhakta prayachati tadaham bhakti upahritam ashnami prayata manaha. Krishna says, if one offers me with bhakti, with pure devotion, a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, prayatatmanaha, following all the proper procedures, uh, then I will accept it. So Krishna spoke this to Arjuna. It's well known in Bhagavad Gita. Who else did he speak it to? Anyone know? Sudama Vipra. When he came to Krishna just with some uh, four morsels, this uh, mushti, this, as much as you can carry in one hand, of chipped rice. And he didn't want to give it to Krishna, but Krishna took by force. Then at this time Krishna spoke the same verse. You'll find in the Bhagavata, 10th canto, chapter 80-something. So... This was a practical example. <laughs> he spoke it theoretically to Arjuna and uh, Sudama actually brought uh, it with pure love for Krishna some uh, chipped rice. I'm not sure exactly whether that falls in the category of patram, pushpam, whatever. But it's this is the kind of food that Krishna likes to eat and his devotees eat uh, his remnants. So this... Uh, Animal killing is allowed in Vedic culture under restriction, but it's not encouraged. And in pure Vaishnavism, it's not there. If one is to be a pure Vaishnava, uh, one cannot uh, support this slaughterhouse civilization, making slaughterhouses for killing animals. It's very sinful. 
pollutes, apart from all this the suffering it inflicts on animals, it's very sinful. As, as Srila Prabhupada points out in this purport of the verse we read, it's hypocrisy. People are talking about peace, justice, equity, but they're killing animals. And they become disturbed uh, at cruelty to humans. But what about cruelty to animals? They also suffer. They also feel. Some, some people in the modern world are waking up to this now, and they're there are animals, rights, movements. Uh, recently in New Zealand, it was recognized by law that animals are sentient beings. There is now, in New Zealand, animals now are sentient beings. Previously they weren't, uh, but now the law recognizes. But I doubt if they're going to stop their New Zealand lamb business. That's one of the big exports of New Zealand. New Zealand lamb. You know what lamb is? Lamb means uh, young sheep. So exporting lamb's meat is a major part of the economy of New Zealand. At least it used to be because uh, it used to be exported to Britain mostly before Britain joined the European Union. Uh, so it's sinful and it pollutes the consciousness. One has to be in polluted consciousness to kill animals anyway. That's why they're a religion. We're talking, we're talking about that in Islam. They, they consider, especially now this Ramadan began, and when they end it, it's bad news for the goats and the sheep because there's thousands and thousands their throats will be cut only by special butchers who know the art of doing it so that the animals are, are bled fully so they can have halal or, or uh, sacred or sanctified meat. But uh, this, is, uh, this is not a high grade of religion. This is not good. Krishna is not pleased. The Supreme Lord is not pleased by animal slaughter. Now, uh, the Vedic culture is also very practical and recognizes, as I'll also quote from Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada often quoted, especially the last pada, the last leg of it, the last three words in this case, ahastan, ahastani sahastanam, Apadani chatushpadam Ahastani sahastanam Apadani chatushpadam Palguni tatra mahatang jivo jivasya jivanam Those who don't, those living beings who don't have hands are prey for those who do have hands. So uh, creatures like fish and snakes, they may be caught by birds and eaten by them. Some humans also eat snakes. Uh, it's also in uh, those devoid of legs are prey for the four-legged. The weak are the subsistence of the strong and the general rule holds that one living being is food for another. Yeah, the natural law in the, in the kingdom of nature is that might makes right. Those who are strong, they eat those who are weak. The big animal eats the smaller animal. Or the, uh, the animals eat the plants. Sometimes the smaller eat the bigger. That's also there. When the big animal dies, the little animals become... And even sometimes a big fish is eaten by a small fish. How is that possible? Because the big fish can't get... How can it be swallowed? It doesn't get swallowed wholly, just like... The mosquito is smaller than us, but still it eats us. So the small fish can take a little little bite out of the big fish. <laughs> so uh, everyone's trying to get something from someone else. Sometimes people say, well, you're also killing plants. And that's true. Vegetarians may also kill plants, but the, suffering, the level of consciousness of a plant such that it does not suffer to the level of an animal. So 
for instance, there's so many jackfruit trees growing just all over the place. Uh, you like jackfruit sabji, come here. You have as much as you like. It's uh, the trees are just going wild, and it's now is the season. You can you can have a, uh, avocado trees growing wild, and what else? Lemon trees? No. Yeah. It should be. Yeah, it should be the right climate for lemon trees also. All kinds of trees are growing wild around here. So when we take a, when we cut a jackfruit from the tree, uh, the tree doesn't feel the pain that an animal feels when you cut the animal's throat. So, and also another point is that you don't actually kill the tree by taking a fruit from it. Similarly, uh, grains such as rice and wheat are harvested after the plant dies. When the when the rice in the field or the wheat becomes yellow, that means already the plant has died, uh, and then you harvest it after that. So, when we take milk from the cow, of course the vegans they complain, but it doesn't kill the cow. So there are uh, gradations. There some violence is unavoidable in this world. Uh, full ahimsa is not possible. Therefore, the uh, Bhagavatam very practically, or wisely we can say, uh, advises proper behavior entails, the, the exact term used is nati hingsena, na ati hingsa, not excessive violence. We cannot avoid some harm to others, but we should not unnecessarily cause harm to others. Uh, and at the present time, the great uh, cruelty is a, is a very prominent symptom of human society. Uh, in the last year or so, avid followers of the news have been shocked by uh, exhibitions of cruelty by members of this Islamic State organization who uh, they, they, after defeating uh, soldiers, their opponents, they capture them and they behead them all. Uh, there was one famous, infamous incident of a young man, Jordanian pilot, who's all, they're all Muslims, they're fighting amongst each other, um, who was put in a cage and then doused with petrol and set alight. And they put it on video so that all the world can see how cruel, how cruel they are. They seem to take pleasure in that. That is a symptom of Kali Yuga. In Bhagavatam is also mentioned one of the symptoms of Kali Yuga is Vritā hingsa. Vritā means meaningless. There's no meaning. Sometimes some cruelty is required. Just like, for instance, uh, some tooth may be pulled out. It's very painful. It seems like cruelty, but it may be required. Uh, dental surgery or... or uh, it, it may be required, a, a, a rabid dog may need to be killed, otherwise they'll go around biting people and giving them rabies also. So sometimes some cruelty is required, but ex cruelty just for the sake of it, taking pleasure in it, this is surely a symptom of Kali Yuga, and people's consciousness is extremely polluted. And to ascribe this to the will of God is uh, certainly perverse. Anyway, it's per cruelty. To be cruel is perverse. And to do so in the name of the all, in the name of the all good is more perverse. Now, um, you might think I'm on a, on a religion, religion bashing uh, talk here today, bashing Buddhism and now Islam, but no, 
Uh, not exactly. We have to understand the science of God. Srimad Bhagavatam means uh, Bhagavad Tattva Vigyanam. Understanding the science of knowledge of God, distinguishing what is proper from what is improper, going beyond mere sentiment or attachment to some religious process without uh, understanding the principles. Uh, otherwise, if we blindly follow, uh, it's very dangerous to blindly follow anything. But, um, well, of course, if, if you get the right path, then blind following can be good. But then that blind following where even the right thing to, to blindly follow it, uh, then we are likely to be misled at some point uh, to some misunderstanding. So, in the Kali Yoga, almost everything everyone does is all based on misconceptions which arise from highly polluted consciousness. So, this Bhagavatam is meant for uh, Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam, saintly people who are free of envy. Envy means to, uh, in the, the way Srila Prabhupada uses the word, means, uh, well, it's very much like hingsa, of which ahingsa is the opposite. It's to, to, dvesha, to, to dislike others, to be, to have malice. Malice is a good word to have bad feeling towards others for no good reason. Yeah. So ahimsa, uh, it, it's a principle, non-violence. It's a principle which on principle, uh, every good person should want to adopt. It, it's straightforward. Why should we be, if we want to be good, then we should not cause harm to others. But we have to properly understand what is Hingsa and ah what is Ahingsa. Otherwise, in the name of Ahingsa, uh, of non-violence, we can actually do harm to others. Uh, Srila Prabhupada told the story of a young man who was raised by his aunt who indulged him. As a young man, a young boy, she didn't want to uh, be nasty to him. She, she let him do whatever he likes. So because he didn't train the boy or discipline him in any way, then he had no idea. He didn't know what was wise and what is wrong. He fell into bad company. And as a young man, he was, uh, he became a criminal, a murderer. He was arrested by the state and sentenced to death. So, as his last wish, as he was just waiting to be, uh, have his neck put in the noose, uh, he asked, my aunt is standing there crying. You call her, tell her to come. He told her, you put your ear right next to my mouth, because he was tied up. And he bit her ear, bit it right off very violent thing to do. He said, he said to her, I'm, I'm doing this to you because it's your fault I'm here today. Because you didn't punish me, now I'm being punished in this way. So some, uh, some violence is needed, just like in the schools in Sri Lanka. Still they use this bamboo. Is it not? For, for disciplining the boys. Do you often use that? You use it daily, you have to use it? Yes. Not on the girls. Only boys. How do you discipline the girls? Only by speaking. Only by speaking. But boys get the bamboo cane. I also got when I was a child sometimes. We saw bamboo. The only use we knew of bamboo was for uh, naughty boys in school. <laughs> so some, uh, some, uh, of course, Srila Prabhupada didn't approve of that. 
for our children. It's, it seems, uh, although there are some indications that maybe he did. Um, but uh, some, some discipline is required. If, otherwise, if we say total non-violence, I often gave this example, that if we said, if the government of India was to say, okay, now we're, now we're going to really follow Mahatma Gandhi and no violence, we won't. So then Pakistan will say, very good. And they'll come in and take over the country. Uh, we're seeing the failure of uh, what shall I say, over uh, idealistic liberalism in Europe that we should be nice to everyone and now they've, they've let so many uh, immigrants come in the country, now there's a backlash against them because the many immigrants, they don't want to, they, they have a different outlook on life altogether, especially we're talking here about Muslim immigrants. So. Um, the very liberal countries are now becoming less liberal. Again, for fans of the news, Denmark, one of those Scandinavian ultra-liberal countries, has now um, voted in a government that will be uh, dominated by uh, non-liberals, who so has a backlash against this um, being being nice to people who don't reciprocate in the same way. The idea that we'll all be very nice, but then some people will take advantage of that. So Ahimsa is not a practical policy. Uh, for Although in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions it twice, I believe, uh, as a saintly quality. At the same time, he's exhorting Arjuna to fight. <laughs> Which may seem contradictory, but it is a fact and, and uh, I suppose here in Sri Lanka when the Sinhalese Buddhists were fighting against the Tamils that they they justified that that although they're they're supposed the Sinhalese mostly the are Buddhists the Buddhists are all Sinhalese and most of the Sinhalese are Buddhists um, they must have justified that on the fact that there's sometimes fighting is necessary. It's just practical in this world. You can't, you can't, if you just say no violence, then someone will come and take advantage. So Vedic culture recognizes that Ahimsa is, is the proper platform, but it also recognizes that not everyone's going to be good, so some violence is required. And therefore, there are Brahmanas, who are supposed to be non-violent, and then Kshatriyas, who are supposed to be violent. As Srila Prabhupada points out in a purport, in the Bhagavad Gita as it is, that for uh, just as for a Brahmana to be non-violent is dharmic, for a Kshatriya to be non-violent is adharmic. Kshatriya must be violent when required. Uh, it is required to protect the peace in the world. So, uh, if we are going to be non-violent, which is a very good quality, we, we don't definitely we 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 don't want to we don't want to promote. Yes, yes, let's have lots and lots of violence. To live with non-violence is very good. We see in Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes, the the core of the pastimes are herding cows and playing with the cowherd boys and dancing with the cowherd girls is a very peaceful, uh, non-violent, non-aggressive kind of life. But then when the demons came in Vrindavan, Krishna killed them. Then he went outside of Vrindavan, although he had no uh, inherent wish to. And the reason he stayed outside, uh, as he explained uh, by a Uddhava and personally himself when he met the inhabitants of Vrindavan. I have to stay outside because there are all these demons. I have to look after them. I have to look after them means he has to kill them. Uh, so that is uh, required, although the ideal is a very peaceful 
society. Uh, but ahimsa, if it's only a societal, a social principle, it's only directed toward the body and the mind, then it's mundane, which means that it must degrade into hingsa. If there's no knowledge of the actual principle of non-violence, uh, which means not to envy Krishna, then simply to speak of non-violence, uh, that will degrade, because without coming to a higher platform of Krishna te kila cheshta, doing everything for Krishna's pleasure, then we will think in terms of myself, my family, my friends, my country, my community, uh, and then we'll be in enmity with others, and then mutual uh, distrust, violence, they must follow. So really ahimsa is, it's possible to establish the ahimsa when we come to the fully spiritual platform, putting Krishna in the center. As Srila Prabhupada often gave the example, just like in a, uh, if there is a calm body of water and we throw one stone, and we throw another stone in exactly the same spot, then and we can throw any number of stones in the same spot in the water and the ripples will be concentric. But if we throw in different spots, then or then we the, the nice circular pattern won't be there and the different ripples will be, uh, they'll just make a, uh, they'll clash with each other and make a chaos. So we have to know what is the center. Krishna is the center. Uh, whereas in the Kali Yuga, in the in the uh, in the material world in general, hingsa is the principle, envy. Uh, and in Kali Yoga, particularly so. There there used to be an idea. I don't know how prominent it is now, but that was definitely prominent in the Western world in the last few hundred years. The idea that society is. Uh, developing, we're progressing, everything is getting better. Um, so, the idea is that now, now we're more civilized. Previously, people were barbaric, and they, we used to have the Gen Genghis Khan, and then there were the Huns, and the, the Goths, and Visigoths, and all these people. It was all barbaric. Now we're civilized. And then in the first half of the 20th century in Europe arose uh, Hitler's Nazi movement, which was, uh, which even today in the Western world, there is a strong sense of horror at the, if, if we want to use one word which best describes the whole Nazi movement, we could say cruel. The people are horrified by the cruelty that they perpetrated. <laughs> Actually on their own, not, not even so much on the, uh, on the people who they attacked on the might is right principle. And people of other countries, but the citizens of their own country, their own countries, and particularly the Jews and the, also homosexuals and uh, gypsies, but the, the major group were the, the Jews. How cruel, how cruel could they be? So this idea that now, now we're more advanced, uh, uh, well, they, they took that as an aberration, but we, we see that now it's just, in the 21st century, they, it's become just some, just like, for instance, um, there are these killing drones, which the United States has developed this technology by which they send these drones and they just kill people on the other side of the world. And 
no one seems to care. Of course, the people who are getting killed, they care. But in the mainstream press, it's it's just like something, just just like uh, killing animals in the slaughterhouse. They don't seem to think it's there's anything particularly wrong with it. So cruelty, how cruel can you be? In Europe also, in the 19, what was that, 1980s, there was a war in Yugoslavia. How cruel, stories of the cruelty, how nasty people could be to each other. Once I was a tr on a train in Russia, there was a, uh, there was a, 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 a man in the compartment was that we were in, he, he brought out his knife and he was preparing his cutting bread with it and he told his companion, there was myself and Gunam Dham, my disciple, who traveled with me and translated for me at that time, and there were these other two and this man's, he, I, afterwards Gunam Dham told me that he said, He's, this man told the other man, he said, you see, with this knife, which he was just using for taking fish out of the can and spreading and cutting his bread, he said, with this knife, I used to cut people's eyes out and cut their ears off with the same knife. He was saying as if it's just fun. How cruel. How nasty. How normal. Normal. So this kind of torture and cruelty... Uh, how we, we can hardly imagine how people could even do that what how, how can we take this cruelty out of the world well the first thing we'll have to stop killing animals as Srila Prabhupada points out as long as there are slaughterhouses then this if we, if we are cruel to animals then we'll be cruel to humans also but then if you say then, okay, let's join, make a movement. Peter, people for ethical treatment mm -hmm. of animals. Yes, it's good. They should make a campaign. Stop. But it's only one. There are so many ways in which humans are mistreating each other and mistreating the environment and mistreating themselves. There's so many problems. What to do? What can be done? Uh, if we if we try to solve one problem, okay, let's stop the cruelty problem. Anyway, you can't stop it. But still, there'll be the uh, ecological disaster is going on, economic disaster is going on. What can we do? Kali Yuga is an ocean of faults. Kale dosha nithe rajan asti hieko mahan guna kirtana deva krishnasya. Ah, Mukta Sangha Param Brajet. In Kali Yuga, everything, everything is wrong. It's a great ocean of faults. If you try to enumerate all the faults, there's no end to it. So the only solution is chanting of the holy names of Krishna. And that's not only the solution to the problems in this world, but it's the solution to the whole problem of being in this world. So we can get out of this world and go to Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Iti Shorasha Kam Nam Nam. Kali Kalmasha Nashana Natav Parataropaya Sarave Deshu Drishyate. In this Kali Yoga, these 16 names, they destroy all the contamination of Kali Yoga. And if we search all the Vedas, we can't find a better method than this. So Krishna comes in Kali Yuga as his name. Kali Kali Nama Rupe Krishna Avata Nam Hoite Hoi Sharva Jagate Nishta. In this Kali Yuga, Krishna has descended into the world as his holy names, and the whole universe can be delivered by the chanting of Krishna's names. Um, elsewhere Srila Prabhupada writes another, another perspective that on violence then is not hingsa cruelty means not to preach Krishna consciousness there's another uh, or 
perspective on ahimsa. Srila Prabhupada writes, the word jiva hingsa, envy of other living entities, actually means stopping the preaching of Krishna consciousness. Preaching work is described as paro paka, welfare activity for others. Those who are ignorant of the benefits of devotional service must be educated by preaching. If one stops preaching and simply sits down in a solitary place, he is engaging in material activity. So not preaching is violence and we should also know what to preach, how to preach. Uh, if we preach some nonsense in the name of Krishna consciousness uh, or uh, mundane principles in the name of Krishna consciousness, develop, help the body, help the country and all this kind of thing. That's another kind of violence to, in the name of Krishna consciousness to promote mundane welfare activities and so on. So all these points, is a great science to understand all these points. Science in the sense that it's a great... Uh, uh, discipline, uh, it's all uh, logically connected, it's not simply some uh, religious mumbo-jumbo, uh, everything makes sense, that is the science of Krishna as given in Srimad and Bhagavatam. Uh, so we had a little look just now at uh, Buddha Avatar and the principles of Ahimsa as discussed in Srimad Bhagavatam. And we pray that this land of Sri Lanka may be uh, overwhelmed with the waves of Krishna Prem. People can actually be happy. It's like a, an island paradise in this very beautiful uh, weather is generally quite equable. You can, although here there's been a lot of rain and wind, but uh, I can, so much tea is growing here. But other things could be grown which are better, more use for humankind than tea. <laughs> uh, mm. Lord Rama came here. Of course, some people dispute that. The uh, the geographical location of the Lanka that's described in Ramayana is not the same as here. Of course, he could have moved in that time. It was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, there, there are many places here on this island today which are connected with the pastimes of Rama. So he's here in people's consciousness. <laughs> we want to increase that. May the whole world take the great gift of Krishna consciousness and become free from envy and illusion. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was chanting and dancing in Jarikanda, the uh, the lions and the deer embraced each other. So let the humans also come together and embrace each other in Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. So.